Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 103. Do you wonder if you're taking the right approach when shaping data and pandas? Is your Jupyter workflow getting out of hand? This week on the show, Matt Harrison talks about his new book, Effective Pandas, Patterns for Data Manipulation. Matt discusses working as a corporate consultant and migrating Excel users toward Python. We explore several numpyisms that beginners get stuck on. And Matt shares advice about chaining operations in Pandas, which some developers find controversial. This episode is brought to you by CData Software, the easiest way to connect Python with data. SQL access to more than 250 cloud applications and data sources. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Matt. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. I wanted to talk a little bit about what you do as a consultant. I find it kind of interesting that you focus not only just on Python, but on pandas specifically. Yeah, for the last, I guess, eight years or so, there has been enough inflow of interest to me that I've I've done a bit of consulting around Python, but also a data science subject, so predictive modeling, reporting, that sort of thing. I would say that my most of my bread and butter these days is corporate training. So going into large companies and selling them snake oil, uh, making them proficient in Python. But also, I, I think one of the reasons Python is so popular today is not just for developers, but also from, I would say, as a broad generalization, the scientific community and people who are using Python as a tool who aren't necessarily programmers or trained as programmers or don't necessarily want to be programmers. But there's, you know, 350,000 plus libraries that you can use with Python, right? (laughs) Yeah, a lot of those match up with what people want to do. And so a lot of these people are, yeah, I'm going to use Python instead of Excel or some other tool because it will make my life a lot easier. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that because I I feel... And and have seen that myself. I have a background of kind of working with small businesses and and the tools that they were using and and thinking about ways to kind of move them maybe into could they create their own programs? Could they potentially automate things and move maybe beyond Excel? Mm-hmm. I have a friend who he does environmental science, so they did a lot of field work. His girlfriend works in Hawaii with like the Department of Health. She, you know, was like a total like Excel person, you know, like super deep doing all these very elaborate macros and stuff. And I think she turned the corner this year after I talked to her a little bit about, you know, getting into Python and it's like changed everything for her. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I like to say that Excel is the most popular programming environment in the world. Yeah. (laughs) And and for better, for worse, I mean, it has an awesome out of the box experience, right? Where you can take a third grader and you can sit them down in Excel and they can in five minutes do some pretty cool things. And I think it's just sort of gone on from there. And so, but when you are programming, there are some sort of tricks of the trade, I guess, or or, uh, hard learned rules that can make your experience better. And I think a lot of people who, who come to leverage Excel or power users from Excel or can do really cool things, but it, it tends to be more on like the write once, make it, it's easy to write, but when you come back or you try and collaborate or share with others, yeah, t- that's where the difficulty starts. And, and I think leveraging some tricks of actual programming, software engineering best practices can help with that. The idea that a lot of those people are going to start with a scratch their own itch, kind of like I'm going to automate this simple process and say, or maybe even more elaborate process and, you know, combine things and and do things that they normally would have done in Excel 
uh, reports that they needed to generate, but those would end up being like singular scripts. And then the trouble becomes like, okay, well, how do I communicate <laughs> these techniques to to others, and and how do I like systematize it? Or those are the kinds of things you're talking about. Yeah, or I wouldn't even say scripts. I would say Jupyter notebooks. Okay, right. And and so this is just like some notebook hanging around on someone's desk, and it's like, yeah, it, it works for me, right? Or it worked yesterday or a month ago, <laughs> but how do we make it work and how, how do we move from, yeah, I guess, similar to like Excel makes it really easy to do things and Jupiter makes it really easy to do some things. But there, if you put some guardrails in that, it can make it easier to collaborate and share with others. Okay. There are definitely specific issues that are kind of fraught in the <laughs> Jupiter landscape in the sense that the state of the notebook or the state of the operations that you're running can be run in whatever order you want. And so mm-hmm. you can kind of leave it in kind of a weird kind of thing. I remember that David was on one time we were talking about uh, a survey and they had gone through all these Jupyter notebooks and the majority of them wouldn't, you know, run from beginning <laughs> to end. Right. Yeah. And so I'm guessing that's kind of the similar thing you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes it easy easy to do stuff, but I found a lot of people, it's like at the end of the day, I save my notebook with a date, and then I sort of cross my fingers that when I come back to it, um, <laughs> I, I, I search for the latest date and make sure that hopefully I can run it or I can like look at the numbers on the side and sort of piece together what order the cells were run in to recreate my state. <laughs> I should record a video of you running it or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some odd things like that. Okay, cool. I wanted to talk to you mostly about your your book. And so maybe we could talk about that. Yeah. Who's the book for? My book is Effective Pandas with a subtitle, Patterns for Data Manipulation. And uh, who the book is for, I, I mean, I, I say broadly, it's for anyone who wants to improve their pandas code. But I think that, like I, like I mentioned previously, there are a lot of people out there who are using pandas and by that they're using python and generally they're using jupiter and yeah like i said they don't want to be programmers they don't want to they didn't go to school to be programmers they're like i want to you know study biology or whatever they're they're studying and so the the book i i guess is is i would say probably one of the only books that covertly teaches some software engineering best practices to these people under the guise of learning pandas and writing uh, better code that way that's cool like you you have that background though right you have a computer science background yeah, yeah. I have a computer science degree. I worked, my first job out of college started using Python. It was a, a search company, so doing some natural language processing. Okay. And I sort of got the bug from there. And that was like 20 years ago and, and really haven't looked back. Python's sort of been my tool of choice since then. And sort of along the way, I was doing some business intelligence and had actually written like an OLAP engine for back end for reporting with Python. And around that later after I did that, Pandas came out and I was like, oh, this uh, there are some interesting things about this, and uh, there are some things I like a lot better about this, and sort of jump ship and have been, I guess, somewhat leveraging pandas to do work and consulting and whatnot since then. It's not your first pandas book either, right? It, it's not my first pandas book. So I I wrote a pandas book called Learning the Pandas Library, I think about five or six years ago later was approached to do the second edition of the pandas cookbook hmm. and and so i did that and all along the while i i've been doing a lot of training on pandas and leveraging it for consulting uh, engagements and along the way had i would say started to get some strong opinions about how you should use pandas and what pandas code should look like yeah and and so originally Effective Pandas was like version two of, of my original book, Learning the Pandas Library. But as I got into it, as often happens with these things, it, it was basically just a rewrite. So tear everything down and build it back up. Like percentage-wise, there's probably not a whole lot from the original. Yeah, there's there's like, you know, 
introduction to what a data frame in series looks like and and that's kind of it everything else is like completely new content formed out of a lot of the hard fought stuff in the battlegrounds of <laughs> corporate training <laughs> and yeah. so forth yeah yeah cool yeah i really like your use of data in the examples in the book this is a, a problem i kind of had with a lot of the even official documentation for pandas and other, a lot of other sort of data science kind of stuff. They use these really kind of weird fictitious examples that are <laughs> literally just like A, B, C, and one, two, three, and or and, yeah, and my, random, a bunch of random numbers. Yeah, and it's just mm -hmm. I just glaze over. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, this doesn't mean anything. I mean, even the you know the kind of fun stuff that you do with like you know beetles names and th stuff like that like i'm like okay i can kind of see like some kind of connections and I, I tried to do that in my own training what are some of the other reasons that that you do that yeah uh, i i think you sort of hit the nail on the head it's like when you have random data and especially as you're doing some of the more complicated operations when you start transforming the data pivoting it yeah uh, slicing and dicing it you, and you have random data that doesn't really make sense or it doesn't have any meaning to you you're from my point of view, you're basically like wasting brain power mm. trying to keep track in your brain about what is even going on, right? <laughs> right. Some kind of anchor. <laughs> yeah. So so, right. so so a lot of these things are already sort of confusing as is, like pivoting and unstacking are, are really, I find that they're really hard to get. And, and so if you just throw in random data that doesn't make sense, it's like, I, what's the point of that? And so it, it is a challenge to get data. I mean, I, I've, it's interesting because, you know, in, in, in my training, sometimes people are like, I don't like your data sets that you use during the course. I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I try and use real data, but sometimes the data is more meaningful or applicable to some people than others. Right. But one thing I do try and do, like for some of my clients, what I've done is if, if I do a pandas course, I'll actually teach it with their data, which is kind of cool. They can provide you like a subset of stuff. Yeah. Sometimes I'll like sign an NDA or whatnot. It's like this, this is the data that we're going to learn pandas with. And then I found that those classes have probably been the best, best ones because yeah. already the people in there are subject matter experts. That's their data. And then it's just like, Oh yeah, look at this. Oh, with two lines of code, I can do this. This used to take, right. You know, we were writing this and it took us 50 lines of code and power BI the other day or something. <laughs> right. And, right. and we can just do this. And, and so if you can, I think having real data is super useful but probably even more useful is having data that someone's a subject matter expert in, which is hard in a book, but in, in training is a little bit more easy to do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think of examples where I've done sort of group training before, and I can kind of feel what you're saying already, the light bulbs kind of like going off in people's heads and going, okay, I get it. But also then it's going to spark questions that are so much more meaningful for them. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, and not not only questions, but like insights into into their data. It's like, oh wow, like this training completely paid for itself just with this one insight right here, right? Uh, we yeah. we now understand how servers are utilized or or whatever, and we can take action on that. Is it a hard sell to the person that you're saying, hey, this would be great if I could do this, and these are the reasons why um, to use some of your own data? I mean. Again, you can agree for the NDA and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just depends, right? Uh, different companies have different business policies, and some companies are very tight-lipped, and nothing goes outside certain areas, and other companies are like very, I guess, more loose. So I, do, do I think all companies should do that? I mean, I, I would think ideally they, they would want to because it's, it's going to make the... It, learning more effective but yeah. again there are different business reasons or for whatever people are lock things down so I, I recognize some of the data sets i had done some programming in r and i, I recognize I, maybe there's a crossover or certain data sets that are kind of shared across the the car one mm -hmm. which is pretty common data that i'd seen yeah, we got the car data set, which which is nice, right? Like that sort of makes sense to everyone at sort of an, an intuitive level. Right. I've got like some presidential data, which 
makes sense to some degree. And and then like in some of the time series stuff, it's a little bit more, I guess, uh, catered towards me. <laughs> I was actually planning on doing like a paddle boarding trip down a river that, okay. In, so I live in Utah and Utah is like the second driest state, but I, I wanted to do a paddle boarding trip. And there's this river that supposedly if you want to float it or whatever, you can only float it like two weeks of the year. Huh. And and so part of the data in the time series part of the book is, is based on that because I wanted to make a predictive model that I could start forecasting a month or so ahead when I could <laughs> Getting go your gear on this ready. trip. Yeah. yeah, planning out. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've played around with paddle boarding. I um, had, you know, had the pleasure of living in Hawaii for a little while. Oh, nice. And uh, the, the biggest trick that I had was um, <laughs> my dog loves to swim. And she would love to get on the paddleboard, but then just as easily be distracted and jump off it. And there's <laughs> nothing you can do with that kind of lateral movement except for yeah. fall. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Any, anytime I, yeah, I have a little daughter and trying to like do the dual paddleboard or whatever, two people on the same one is, I don't have the balance for that. Yeah. It's pretty rough. <laughs> C-Data software. Connect, integrate, and automate your data from Python or any other application or tool. At CData, we simplify connectivity between all of the applications and data sources that power business, making it easier to unlock the value of data. Our SQL-based connectors streamline data access, making it easy to access real-time data from on-premise or cloud databases, SaaS, APIs, NoSQL, and big data. Check out cdata.com to learn more. I, I like the uh, the subtitle, and I, I wonder about that. Like, what's kind of the meaning behind patterns for data manipulation? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think once you start looking at data and you've seen people making models and leveraging data for reporting, uh, you, you start to see repeated things. You start to see these patterns. Okay. And, and so, I mean, that's sort of a high level. You could talk about like tidy data, getting your data so it's tidy, so that like every row is a sample, that sort of thing. But also, you know, when you hear someone say like, I want to summarize these by month, what does that mean? And And it goes back to sort of like, to me, it's like, oh, this is, kind of like word problems in math, right? When you say by month, that means you want to do a group by and you want to put the month in the index or you want to pivot and put the month in the index, right? And so Pandas is a really rich API that allows you to do a lot of things, but I, I look at it as like, I've got my raw data and I need to get it in this form to make a predictive model or do reports or to compare it to something else. And what are the steps or the, patterns that I'm going to apply along the way to do that. So I think those patterns are generally data agnostic and are pretty common. And so I think once you uh, master those, it really makes coming to an arbitrary data set and sort of getting it ready for analysis pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, I always think about the little bit of time that I I spent doing that kind of work of sort of cleaning data Mm -hmm. and and some of the and a lot of those sort of techniques that you you end up really learning very specific like sort of (laughs) normalizing learning kind of interesting string methods and things like that to kind of clean up stuff what what kinds of things are in the book about i don't know cleaning data and and preparing it using pandas yeah so cleaning data i mean generally If you're doing like machine learning, uh, some things you want to be aware of is that all of your data needs to be numeric for most modeling. Mm. And so one thing is just going through the types of your data. I found in my, you know, sample size one, I found that a lot of people are working from CSV files, comma separated value files, which are great in that they're human readable, but that's about the extent of the greatness. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So they don't have type information, right? And they tend to be encoded in weird Windows encoding formats or whatnot. But if you have a column that has some entry that's not numeric, then pandas will 
load it, but it will not convert it to a number, right? And so yeah. stepping through those, you know, making sure that they are numeric. Uh, another problem is missing data, you know, and data can be missing for various reasons. So that can be a process in and of itself just to figure out why it's missing and then figure out the correct way of uh, either replacing that or dropping that. There's various janitorial work. I, I've seen data sets where it's like the first 50 rows or more are interspersed with test data that's incomplete schemas, mm -hmm. right? And right. people just, hey, here's our database. Let's start sticking things in it. And they <laughs> started off putting test data in it, right? And then that, over time, they added columns. And, and so you have a bunch of missing data or incomplete data or test data in there. So dealing with that's certainly interesting. And then again, for machine learning, sort of taking string or categorical data and finding a way to encode that in a representation to model it. So these are all things that Pandas is used for, or could be used for. And I mean, it's been said that for data science purposes that this data janitorial steps they, they tend to take you know 80 percent of the time yeah <laughs> that's my experience <laughs> Cre creating a model is relatively easy uh you know it's like three lines of code but uh, to, to get the data ready to where you can actually model it uh, might be a little bit more complicated yeah what were some of the concepts that you were most eager to share in the book yeah, I, I, I guess the biggest one, and this is probably the most controversial one, is the notion of chaining. Okay. So if your listeners aren't familiar, so in, in Pandas, there's sort of two main data types that we use. One is a data frame, which you can think of as a database table or maybe a spreadsheet, a sheet from a spreadsheet. And the other is a series, which uh, I think the correct analog is, is a column from a database or a column from a spreadsheet. And it turns out that due to how Pandas works, like I said, I, I, there's like 400 different attributes of a series or a data frame. And uh, the majority of those methods that you can call on a series or a data frame will return another pandas object, either a series or a data frame, or if it's a reduction, it might return some scalar value. What I found when I started using pandas is, you know, you have all these 400, well, not 400 public, but you have, you know, a couple hundred public methods and you start just calling these public methods and then they'll give you a result. And then you sort of in Jupyter, you'll keep a variable around holding this intermediate result. And the process of cleaning your data is not making intermediate things, but it's like, we want to start from the raw data and we want to clean it up and have the finished data. Um, the intermediate steps is kind of noise <laughs> or, you know, to keep yeah. that around. For me, I, I, I tend to look at things as like, what is occupying my brain and, and what's distracting me, right? And so having variables just sitting around is, is clutter and occupying your brain. And so it turns out that you can make these intermediate variables or because most things in Pandas return uh, data frames or a series, you can just say, Here's the first thing I need to do. I need to rename my columns. And the thing after that I need to do is fix these missing values. And the thing I need to do after that is create a new column. And you can just write a chain of these operations in basically a, a big, I like to say it reads like a recipe, right? Yeah. We're going to do this, <laughs> then this, then this. With like sort of dots in between. <laughs> yeah, with, with dots in between. And so... It, Actually, going back to the Pandas 1X cookbook, so I, I wasn't the original author of that, mm -hmm. um, but I, I did read that book, the original version, I liked it, and that's why i like, sure, I'll, I'll do my take on that. And, and my take on that was basically, I, I thought most everything in there is great, but I, I just sort of cleaned up, I, I would say cleaned up the code. I, I wrote a few extra chapters that, you know, put some other chapters that weren't in there in there, but tried to rewrite it in this chaining style. And then after that, and then just thinking about, you know, as I was planning on rewriting my book and teaching Pandas courses, universities and at large companies, like all the Pandas code I see is pretty messy. 
And just by chaining it, it really is like a constraint that actually enables you to write cleaner code, think about what your code is looking like. And I think it makes it actually easier to debug and understand your code. So I had some time I spent in R, which I, I think I kind of mentioned briefly there. Mm-hmm. They have a, a pipe operator and in yeah. that whole tidy universe kind of thing. There's ways to do exactly what you're talking about, this sort of chaining thing. Uh-huh. And for me, I feel exactly like you do, that somebody could say a problem to me and I could almost sort of like visualize right in my head exactly the chain mm-hmm. <laughs> of like, this is going to pipe into this and this is going to pipe into this. And, and it would be like, And you can write it in a really kind of pretty way too, in the same with what you're doing here, you know, if you format it properly, that that they'll just sort of be, you know, the next step is, you know, one line down, you know, and it's sort of chaining off of that. I was thinking like, if there's a way that we could make that in an audio form, (laughs) that would make sense. Like what, what a typical chain might look like. Basically you're calling methods on the data frames or yeah. in this case you can be you know choosing specific you know columns or other things as you're as you're doing it but i also agree with the idea that if you and i would do this as i was cleaning sometimes as an experiment i would do like you know big jupyter notebook and each cell would be a step and i would then kind of like look at the frame again and go okay does this do this and so forth but after all that's done it, it does make more sense to to make it all one recipe you know uh-huh. and kind of like you know uh maybe turn all the other stuff into comments of like, okay, this is what I, how I kind of came up with this recipe. Yeah. But like, I agree having all those additional, not only does it take up a bunch of extra sort of memory to have all these sort of interstitial <laughs> versions of the data frame there. But in this case, you can kind of, you know, just kind of continue all the way through. I don't know if I have a question there more than a comment, but do you, can you think of like a, like a, maybe a multi-step process that we could explain like what a chain would kind of read like? Yeah, let's let's try and do this for the radio listeners out there. Sure. <laughs> um, so, so if you think about like all of these operations, generally will return a due data frame, and and you know there are some detractors of chaining who say, well, there's like the in place parameter, and if you use the in place parameter, then you you don't have to chain, right? And and so let me maybe just address that common complaint. Sure. And and then. So, so in place, in a lot of these many methods in, in pandas, there's an in place parameter. When you call the method, you can pass in place. And if you pass in place, rather than uh, returning a new data framer series, generally what it will do is it will update this object, uh, quote, in place. However, uh, it turns out that if you actually peel back the curtains and look at what the code is generally doing, uh, generally in place is not doing what you think it's doing. It's not actually doing an in place it's actually copying the data that's one of the complaints people have they're like well if if you're if you're you know chaining you're copying the data and it turns out that yeah pandas copies data and in place actually most of the time copies data in fact there's a bug to actually deprecate and remove in place from pandas because people think it's doing something that it's not doing and it generally doesn't save you memory it's and just basically doesn't return anything and so so my, my thing with that is you can't chain. Uh, so, so software engineers might be familiar with the law of Demeter, which is basically another complaint that people might have about chaining. The, the idea there is that like if you've got classes, which I don't think the law of Demeter really applies here, but the, the notion is if you have classes who have members and you keep doing like a, an access of those members to access the members, then you're sort of breaking the object-oriented conventions of not letting your privates be exposed to others. I, I don't really buy that from pandas because it's not really privates. It's it's returning objects that are basically the same type. What it will look like, I mean, I mean I've got one on the screen here, but so, okay. so maybe I can just sort of read it and describe what's going on here. So I, I'm 
I'm teaching a course on uh, doing sales reporting with pandas. And the idea is, you know, you, you want to make some sales report. And so I, I've got some data. And the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, filter my data to make sure that these line items are things that weren't refunds, that they were paid items. So I, I have a call to the query method. So uh, actually, I, I actually format this a special way. And so this is going to be maybe a little bit weird to Python people as well. Okay. I, I will put a parenthesis around my chain. Uh, so open parenthesis, then close parenthesis. This isn't like a method call or a generator expression. This is a parenthetical parenthesis, or like as in if you're going to add two numbers and then multiply them, if you want to add them first, you put the parenthesis around them. In Python, when you put a parenthesis around something, I mean, you can put a parenthesis around uh, any expression. Yeah. It generally won't have an impact. But what it allows us to do is it allows us to span multiple lines, ignoring white space rules get a nice visual grouping of everything. Yeah, so what I like to do is I will I will put a print C and then I will put my data frame, my my raw object at the top and then each line will be one operation or one of these manipulation patterns or whatnot, right? So so my my sales report here says first line is sales and the next line is dot query and then I'm querying that the status is equal to paid. And then the line after that is I'm going to do a grouping because I want to group by date. And I actually want group by date and category to get the summaries for those. So the next line is group by, and it start period group by. And then after that, pandas, when you do a group by, it actually doesn't give you a data frame. It gives you back this lazy group by object. But if you aggregate to complete the pivoting or the aggregation, then it will give you back an, an, an object. So I'm, my next line after that is to say aggregate, and I'm going to make a new column called total cells. It's going to sum up the cells columns. And I'm going to have another column called total items. It's going to count the cells items that were sold. That's actually two lines, one for each of those columns that it creates. And then the line after that is an unstack operation, which is going to, because I, I've grouped this by date and by category, I have a, what's called a hierarchical index. And so I'm going to unstack, I'm going to pull out the category and make it into a column. Okay. And so you just sort of keep going. The next line after that, I'm assigning a new column that's derived from what I passed in. And then I've got another line after that that's flattening my hierarchical columns. And I've got another line after that that's resetting the index. And, and so I've, I've sort of built this up. You can read it as, you know, these are the steps that you're going to do. But again, as was mentioned, you, you really, as you said, you don't want those interstitial results, right? That's, that's right. just noise that's getting in your way. And what I've also found, Christopher, is that a lot of people, when they're sort of processing these, they weren't generally go in a linear manner, yeah. like start at one cell and make the cells below them. They'll oftentimes make a cell above or somewhere else. <laughs> oh, stuff so, we're talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, which, which <laughs> makes that complicated. So wh when you have this chain and you just sort of build it up, right, you do line by line, you run it, and then you add a new line and then you run it, you're sort of debugging it as you go. But then the other really nice thing about this is that you can take this code, and, and this is... is like really helps with the Jupyter problem is you just take this code, throw it into a function. I like to generally say it like tweak whatever data frame, right? Tweak my cells, right? And then I, I throw that at the very top uh, after I do my imports in my Jupyter notebook, the next cell is load the raw data. And then here's my tweak function. And if I run those two cells, I can basically come to my notebook and I know that like I'm in a good state and everything works, right? I don't have to run 50 cells in some arbitrary order to get me back to the state I need to be in. Yeah, that's nice. Thinking about that, what are other additional stumbling blocks that, that Excel users kind of face moving into something like Pandas? Yeah. I mean, one would be like NumPyisms that are, are just, and, and th that's not even specific to uh, Excel. I, I would say that a lot of Python users who are like maybe web developers who have used Python uh, might not be familiar with some of the maybe interesting ways that, that NumPy works. So like slicing in NumPy is I would say pretty different than what most people are used to in slicing like a string or a list. Okay. Using the normal like 
the square brackets, square brackets yeah. and colon and everything. Yeah. So in, in NumPy, you can make n-dimensional objects. And so you don't just slice them off of one dimension, but you can slice them off of any of these dimensions, right? And so you're not just putting in a single slice into the indexer. You're putting actually a tuple of slices so you can comma delimit them. That's something that's... I think interesting to a lot of people. Another one is just the whole notion of vectorization and that how NumPy treats a matrix of data rather than, you know, if you have a list in Python of numbers, you can do operations on that. But Python's a slow language. And, you know, if you want to add two to every number in that, you can loop over it or do a list comprehension and map plus two to each of those. And that certainly works. But, you know, when you get into sort of the, quote, data science or what realm, uh, people tend to have a little bit more data or, and might take a little bit longer to do that. And that's where, like, NumPy comes in really nice is you can say, okay, I've got a list of numbers or I've got a matrix. And NumPy actually abstracts that. It's not representing that as, as a bunch of Python on numbers is basically here's a block of memory allocated on ram and it can leverage simd instructions and you can just say i have this block of numbers add two to them and that happens at the cpu level so that notion of instead of using loops but just leveraging vectorization staying in what i would call the fast path rather than jumping back to python you gain not only memory performance but you also gain really great speed performances as well. You know, you can get 10, 50, 100 times speed improvement by doing that. And that kind of relates all the way back to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier of like, if you bring in stuff from a CSV, it may not know what to think and kind of generically makes everything an object. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to sort of like, okay, we got to think about data types here to, to kind of harness that too, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, something that you would think, oh, in Python, if I just have a list, then I'm good to go, right? Well, in, in Pandas, you might have a data frame, but and it might have loaded, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what you think is numbers are actually numbers. So, some other things that uh, for, I guess, maybe Excel people or whatnot, that might be uh, a little bit of a challenge or, or interesting is that the whole notion of functional programming, again, if you are adopting this chaining style, you end up using a lot of functional programming in that you're passing around functions into other methods. And and the reason for that is when you're working on a chain, you have the intermediate state. And so oftentimes you want to do some operation based on the intermediate state, not on the original data. You've pivoted it, you've added rows or columns. And so if you need to add a new column, you really need to work on the pivoted version, not on the original version. And so Pandas does have a way to do that, like with the assign method, this assign is used to make new columns or update columns but if you pass in a a function to that then it will it will pass in the current state of the data frame and you can work on the current state there's also a, similar to what you were talking about before in r there's a pipe method which is just a generic uh, you pass in a function and that function takes a data frame and you can pass in various other arguments as you want to and you can return whatever you want but you can make a pipe to do arbitrary operations and return a new data frame and keep chaining on that. So, it, you know, if it, oftentimes people will use lambdas instead of functions there. And, and so lambda is just the syntax of that and then embedding that tends to be a little bit of noise. And so it takes a little bit of, I guess, um, getting used to that syntax if you don't want to pass around functions that way. In addition to just the whole, what, what I find that a lot of people find brain bending that like you are passing in a function into this method. You are not calling the function. The function is being called underneath the covers that, that tends to be confusing to a lot of people. Yeah. Would you lean toward defining the function and then like, you know, naming it and then using a different method that as opposed to like doing these one-off Lambda functions as you create it, do you find a clarity in one way or the other? Yeah, I, I, I guess I think I sort of take a similar approach to what I take with like a list comprehension. Like if I'm doing a list comprehension that has a single for loop, generally a list comprehension I find more readable than a single for loop. Okay. But if it's a nested for loop, oftentimes I find that 
if I got two for loops, you, you can make a list comprehension with n number of for loops in it. <laughs> right. um, but but it, I find it gets hairy, right? And I, I want my code to be easy to read, yeah. not just easy to write. And so there's there's a trade off there, right? Where that line is uh, might differ from person to person, but I think it's similar to lambdas. Oftentimes, you know, if it's just a simple lambda, I like. I do like having the context of having, you know, here is what we're doing exactly. You know, here's what this new column is derived from. And you can just look at the code and it's taking the current state of the data frame and pulling out this column and summing it or something like that, right? Sure. Okay. Can you do something like that with a function? I mean, you can make a descriptive function name, but oftentimes I will if I, you know, if if my Lambda is getting a little bit hairy, or even if I can't even do it in a Lambda, right, then I might resort to a function there. And similarly, like I, I might take a few steps of my chain, if they maybe are a, think of them as, they're not really the individual parts, but combined, they're like a unit, I might just throw those into a function and then put a pipe around that, right? That's like pipe to this chain or mini chain that's just going to do clean up and remove these columns right okay and, and have that be its own uh, unit yeah one of the things I, I kind of going back to sort of the format and the design of the book you have lots and lots of exercises which i i really <laughs> I, I find really great and at the beginning a lot of them are kind of more i don't know thought experiments than they are like uh, problems as you kind of progress. Um, what, what's your thought process there of you know, making these sort of thought experiments? Yeah. I, so one of the things that I've, my, my opinions have gotten stronger on over the years is, you know, I, a lot of people are like, I want to learn Python or I want to learn whatever technology. And, and a lot of people have the feeling that like, all I have to do is like read a book or listen to some talk and I'll be good to go. And, and <laughs> to some degree that might be okay, but I've found that most people sort of goes in one ear and out the other to really, to really start feeling comfortable with it. You need to, I think, put it into practice. And, and the challenge for me sort of goes back to what we were talking about, Christopher, about data. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess, you could say it's maybe a cop out, right? Like you, you just have thought experiments or you're like, do this with your own choice of data. But um, my intent there, I, I do strongly encourage people to do exercises, but my intent there is like, if you have data that is interesting to you, either interesting because your work is paying you to make it interesting to you, or it's like some hobby project, like you want to float down this river and you can only float down at a certain time, you're going to be a lot more motivated to complete that than if uh, Matt gives you arbitrary, you know, data and, and, and just go work on this movie data set. Eh, some people might be interested in movies, but maybe some people aren't or the context of them just doesn't make sense. So, yeah, there's sort of a give and take. And it, it goes back to, you know, my, my experience teaching and with my clients who have, you know, like I said, I think the most successful courses I've had have been with clients who have brought in their own data and you just see the light bulbs go off when they start oh okay yeah it makes a lot more sense yeah i always think of you know any kind of thing that if you're going to be motivated to to learn piano guitar you know like an instrument or something like that you have to <laughs> take it and do stuff at home and, and keep playing around with it and yeah i mean i'm sure there's lots of people that have collected you know, untold numbers of books or tutorials or what have you and the the problem is you know you got to apply it you got to you know play with it to, yeah for any of it to really sink in yeah and i i yeah your your piano example is spot on i have kids who play music instruments and uh you know getting them to practice from the book is like pulling teeth but it's like <laughs> oh i'm gonna go play whatever daft punk or whatever right. and just like sort of jam out to that <laughs> and like do that for a half hour right and it's like yeah that's awesome right because it's something that's applicable to them and yeah i i think anything any excuse you can do to to apply it is and the science tells us that it's going to fit into your brain a lot better right you're going to start making connections you already have connections in your brain to your data and and that is now going to be related to this new technology. So you're going to learn a lot better. 
I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. Continuing the theme of the episode, it's about working in pandas, and it's titled Sorting Data in Python with Pandas. The course is based on a RealPython article by Spencer Guy. And in the lessons, Darren Jones takes you through sorting a data frame by the values of one or more columns, using parameters to change the sort order, sorting a data frame by its index and exploring advanced index sorting concepts, working with missing data while sorting values, sorting the columns of your data frame and working with the axis, and choosing how you want to modify your data frames with the different sort methods. Learning these pandas sort methods is a great way to start practicing basic data analysis in Python. Like most of the video courses on real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all courses have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. One of the other things that you were able to implement in the book is is color. And I actually almost was like shocked when I opened the book. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Like I'm not used to seeing that in so many of the technical books that I look at. What do you find as an advantage of you know, providing that in, in your book? Yeah. I mean, that, w- that was one of the things I wanted to do. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, so I, you know, th- this is a self-published book. Um, but I, like I, my pandas one X cookbook isn't self-published and I have another book, a uh, machine learning pocket reference, uh, that wasn't self-published, but like O'Reilly would send me a bunch of like the translations of the pocket reference. And I would get these translations from like, polish or whatever and and they're in color and i'm like what <laughs> why do, why do they why do they get color right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so i i mean i i knew it was possible and sadly it does make the book more expensive it's a lot more expensive to to make a color book than a non-color book but for a lot of these concepts like the pivoting and stacking and melting data and window windows uh, over your data i think having color there does it, it gives you a little bit more than than a black and white and 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 these concepts i think can be so brain bending that just that little hint i think can be useful and and the feedback on on the color is some people are upset because it costs more, but generally the people are, <laughs> right. are are pretty happy. They're like, oh, this is awesome. This this makes it a lot more clear. Yeah, I mean, you do a lot of data visualizations kind of later in the book. And then I really like the chapter about styling data frames because I, I think that's another one of those things where even people that use Excel <laughs> go out of their way to to make it presentable and, and maybe not generic always. And, you know, especially along with owning your own data, owning the style of it and making it look attractive to people or at least show the things that you want to show. Yeah. What were reasons that you wanted to include that? Yeah. I, color can be used. I, I mean, I, again, going back to this goes back to when I was doing business intelligence reporting, we had our client was like, we want this big table with. 60,000 rows and 500 columns. And we're like, you really don't want that. They're like, no, we really do want this. And it's like, well, human humans are optimized for that, right? And to look at like large amounts of data in tables, like we didn't evolve to do that. But we, we are optimized to like look at good visualizations and we can leverage color to uh, make visualizations stand out and and so you know I, I do have some examples like common technique in for that a lot of visualization experts will use is, is when they're doing a line plot and you've got like 30 lines that you're plotting well it gets kind of messy if they're all a unique color well, how do you handle that and so a common technique is to like say well maybe you want to draw attention to one of the lines so you grayscale out the other ones and then you just make the one saturated color right yeah. So you you can do things like that in color. Could you do that in a black and white version? Yeah, you could, but the the effect isn't as strong 
there are other examples that I see as well. Like I see color misused all the time. A common one is like, so if you want to do a correlation matrix in pandas, it's really easy. You just take your data frame and say dot core, and it's going to take all of your columns and it's going to cross correlate them with themselves. So you'll, you'll get, you know, does column A correlate with column B with a Pearson correlation coefficient from negative one to one? And that, that can be super nice for analyzing the relationships with, with your data. And a, a common, like, I, I would say faux pas visualization that I see is people, people do that all the time and then they'll throw on like a color map, but they won't. Pandas has a way of when you throw, when you apply a background gradient using this style mechanism, you can say I want to use a color map, and you can use like a diverging color map, which is the appropriate choice. So a diverging color map would go from like maybe red to white, and then blue or green. So the middle is white, and if you apply that correctly to a correlation matrix, what you'll see is like things that don't correlate will tend to be white, yeah. but things that correlate positively will tend to be blue and things that correlate negatively will tend to be red. But a lot of people just like throw on any arbitrary color map on that because they think it looks cool. And you're like, you're looking through this and it's like, am I looking at the pinks, the greens or the yellows? (laughs) What's important. (laughs) Yeah. Or even people will take a, a diverging color map, but they'll forget that most things in nature don't have a negative one correlation. You, you will see like a, a one correlation because you get the uh, the auto correlation of a column with itself, but you don't see a negative one a lot in nature. And so, what happens is is the color map is going to take the uh, most negative value, which might be like a point two, and they will put that at red, and then it will put like one at blue. Oh, and so you'll see shifted. everything that's around zeros should be white, but they'll they'll be like this pink shade. And so it really throws off the visualization because you're thinking things that are not cor- things that really aren't correlated have a negative correlation. So, I mean, there, there are really cool things that you can do with color that, yeah, I, I, I think, and, and, and visualizing, uh, going back to those courses, you know, one of the nice things about pandas is pandas. I think pandas has a better interface than Matplotlib for plotting. Hopefully that doesn't get me too much hate mail. <laughs> um, but, but like literally it, it's like one line to do a plot and you can, you can, and just tack and, and on your chain, you can just tack on a single line at the end of it. And oftentimes you can do a really nice visualization there. And, and so it makes it super powerful to like, once you understand these patterns of how, how plotting works with pandas, and you can leverage the notion of like what what's a compelling visualization, it's super useful, and, and the clients have gotten a ton of value out of that. Yeah, and they're not having to learn another library per se. They're just yeah, kind yeah, of expanding a, their learning yeah. for, for pandas. Yeah, it's a single method to call to make to make a plot. Yeah, cool. Do you have any other sort of favorite pandas tips that you want to share? Um, I mean, I, I guess a, another common one which that you'll see a lot, you'll see a lot of people saying, use apply, use apply, use apply. And, and so for for those who aren't familiar, uh, apply is basically a backdoor in pandas to let us go down the slow path. Remember the slow path is, is Python code and it can be useful, right? Um, So if you've got a column of of data and you want to apply an arbitrary Python function to each uh, member of that, you you can. You can say apply. And what Pandas is going to do, it's going to pull out the data, convert it to a Python object if it's not a Python object, and then call the Python function and then take the, the item back and then stick it back into the the memory location, which is a lot of overhead, right? You're you're going down that slow path. Right. So generally you don't want to use apply unless uh, i would say a caveat to that is if you're if you're doing string manipulation strings by sort of default how pandas represents them is sort of the slow path there isn't really vectorized string operations anyway so i'm sort of okay with that uh with strings but generally if you're using apply with numeric data you're going to get a huge boost if if you find a way to do it without apply and and oftentimes there is a way to do it without apply What's some other, I, I, I would say this, maybe, maybe this is an interesting way of answering your question, Christopher. 
people who follow me on Twitter will, will note that I don't tend to post a lot of cat pictures. <laughs> I, I tend to post yeah. <laughs> generally, generally my images are like images of code. And, um, oftentimes are that like recently because of the book and whatnot, I, I posted a lot of pandas code in there, which often includes these chains. And uh, this tends to bring out, uh, uh, it's, it's like th- there isn't any lukewarm response to this. It's either like people are like, this is awesome. Or people are like, this is the worst code ever. This is not Pythonic. Someone said, I think this is the worst code ever. Someone said, I wouldn't want to work with you as a colleague. People will say things like that, wow. which is fine. But, but I would say that my, my challenge, and maybe I'll, I'll throw this out to your users is, is if you have not tried this chaining style, my challenge would be give it a try. Right. Yeah. And what I found is is that if you put on sort of those restrictions that like I'm going to write this as a recipe step by step, uh, your code your your code will be cleaner and it will be less lines of code. It will actually use less memory because you won't have all these intermediate objects. But my, so so my challenge would be you know find some code and rewrite in this chain style and then you know if you want to you can tweet me or whatever. I. I often ask people who are like, I don't want to work with you. I'm like, okay, seriously, not trolling. Like rewrite this and, and, you know, write it in, in a way that's Imp- improve it for me. Yeah. Improve it for me. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to being imp- improved upon. Right. And, and, right. and generally most people are, I guess they're more trolling than, than serious. Right. Because <laughs> right. they're like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but that'd be my challenge to people is, is just try it out. Right. It, I think, I think from my point of view, it's very similar to when I teach about white space and in, in Python, that tends to, to bring a similar response. You've got people who have been programming in whatever language for whatever. And, and I go into companies and they're like, okay, um, we're going to use Python. So we need to level up these people on Python. You have people who've been programming in C for 30 years or so. And they're like, oh, white space. This is so annoying, right? I, I, what? And they just, <laughs> it, it just bothers them so much, right? But I'm like, yeah. just try it, right? And then after a day, it's like not even an issue. Yeah. And, and so I guess that would be my challenge. Like, just give it a try. And and I'm certainly open. Like, my, my goal, like I said, is to write good code and clean code. And, and so if there's a, a way to do it better, I'm certainly open to that. Yeah. I, I really like the book. I, I got a lot out of just kind of going through it. I'm definitely going to dive in much deeper. Um, there's definitely a lot in there <laughs> to, to dig into. Oh, well, thanks. So I have these weekly questions. And the first one is, what are you excited about in the world of Python? That could be an event or a book or, yeah, or what have you. Yeah, I guess I am excited about PyCon, the conference this year. Um, it's actually in my backyard. I mean, I I live I, I live in Utah, so so um, for those who are willing to brave uh, whatever, to, um, if if you're up to conferences, I'm excited. Hopefully, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to happen. So that that will be exciting to sort of go to a conference after a, a while and have it be local. So that's what, that's what I'm stoked about. Are you doing a, a talk at all? I don't think I'm doing a talk and I'm not sure I've got rejections for all of my tutorial proposals yet. Uh, okay. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay, cool. The next one is what would you like to learn next? And that doesn't have to be Python specific. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think we're some, something that I'm um, interested in, in sort of revisiting is Docker. Oh, okay. I mean, I've, I've done stuff with Docker and Python before, but I think the, the landscape and best practices have changed a lot since maybe the last four years when I was doing stuff with it. So I think it'd be interesting for, for me just to revisit that because I also... It seems that reproducible environments tends to be sort of this persistent problem, and yeah, so I, I might have some personal personal needs for for doing that. Do you have a, a particular resource that that you like out there for that? I, I do. Some of the interesting resources that I've seen coming out are from uh, PythonSpeed.com. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Edmar Turing Char. Yeah, he he was a guest a, a while ago. He's really good. Yeah, he seems to be thinking about this a lot. And yeah, my my goal will probably just be to sort of like 
refresh and see what people are doing these days with Docker and and how sort of best practices have changed and, and how that applies to the Python world. Yeah, cool. Do you have any shout outs or calls to action that you want to share? Let's offer your listeners a, a discount to the book. So I'll okay. I'll give you a link and if they're interested in a discount to Effective Pandas, happy to give that to them. Cool. Yeah, I'll include it in in the show notes. Awesome. And then if people want to connect with the stuff that you do online, how what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, uh, Dunder M. Harrison, underscore, underscore, M. Harrison, underscore, underscore. And I'm on LinkedIn as well. So if people want to reach out and chat, Python, pandas, or training for your for your company, happy, happy to discuss those. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been really great to talk to you, Matt. Yeah, pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Don't forget, you can get simple cloud data connectivity to SaaS, big data, and NoSQL from Pandas, SQL Alchemy, Dash, and Petal. Learn more at cdata.com. I want to thank Matt Harrison for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.